This talk is going to really focus upon the, uh, the use of Carbofix and carbon fiber products and uh, similar products uh, of that ilk. My own experiences personally and also experiences that I've also seen um, from Bruce up in Gwinnett and also from John and other people that have used this around the country. We've had a lot of great success with it. We've also seen some areas where we are trying to learn uh, and improve. Overall, what we see in this uh, technology that there is a lot of promise to it and that it solves many of the problems that traditional metal implants uh, can't solve or are uh, short on. And so our hope is that from this, it helps expand your horizon, um, that it makes you see that there are many different solutions out there that you can use. The primary take-home message through all of this is that if we start thinking that metal implants are it, and by that I mean if we start thinking that what we have is good enough, that's when we fall short as orthopedic surgeons. And so I think for all of us, the learning point that we have is that we can always make things better. We can always improve. And I think this is one of the avenues that we can use to try and improve on the care that we deliver to our patients. So there is an evolution of implant materials that we've seen over the past 40 to 50 years. Okay? And this evolution is very similar to what we've seen in non-orthopedic markets. So when we look at aerospace industry, when we look at prosthetics, when we look at equipment, we see that there is an evolution of materials that we use both because of weight, we also see it because of fatigue strength and failure rates. And so if you look at planes, there is now more adaptation of carbon fiber implants. If you look at uh, prosthetics, there is now more adaptation of carbon fiber implants as well. And so it begs to ask, well, why don't we use carbon fiber more often in orthopedics? And I think when hans Jörg Wiss had that idea of using carbon fiber, that was really the beginning of that thought. It was a continuation of that thought, really. And so we've seen stainless steel implants for many, many years. Okay, we've, been, we've all used it before. We've all touched it. We all know where it can function very well, but we've also seen where it can fail. Okay? And titanium came out as a response to some of the inherent failures of stainless steel. And so as John said before, the biggest way that they promoted titanium was that it was closer to the modulus of bone. And that was going to enhance healing. It was going to be easier for pliability. It was going to be easier for application. There was also talk about how titanium was also much more favorable for infectious environments. And so because of that, a lot of people gravitate towards titanium. But that also came at a cost issue. Okay. And so carbon fiber came out as a response to titanium as well. Now, the thing with carbon fiber initially, which was a very, very big problem, was that carbon fiber was a very expensive implant to make. Okay, so that was initially some of the initial uh, problems with carbon fiber, but a lot of companies, such as Carbofix, they've now come up with a way that's a lot more cost friendly and they can make an implant that is good if not better. So what are the disadvantages that we talk about with metal? Okay, well, the thing is that number one, there is a high elasticity modularity compared to bone. Okay, and so there is a healing implications to it. So if you look at the literature for distal femurs for the past seven to 10 years, the biggest gripes that they had with distal femur fixation when you use standard stainless steel plates is that the modulus was too high. It was too stiff and it would then induce a non-union. You would put in implants that was not allowing enough flex within the fracture site to allow for callus formation. And so the primary reasons why we put distal femur plates are in you know, old ladies who have these paraprosthetic fractures and they don't heal very well and you have a massive degree of non-unions, almost 25 to 30 percent, okay? Well, titanium solves some of that problem, but we're still seeing the exact same problems, though, with titanium. The modulus was still a little bit too high. They weren't unable to really get the stress strain that they really needed for the healing to occur, and there was a big problem with the non-union sites in that area. We are now starting to see, and hopefully John's study can really show this, is that probably carbon fiber may be the answer to this. We're starting to see a lot more early robust callus formation for this. And so because of that, this may be the solution to the problem that we are all experiencing with this ephemeral fixation, particularly in osteoporotic models. The other thing with metal is that it's radio opaque. You can't really see through the plate to really assess the volume of callus formation that you have or, or also the degree of consolidation and bone healing. Okay, Sean Nork from Seattle once said it best. He said, the reason why I like to put metal is because it hides my imperfections. People can't see how bad my work really is. Well, unfortunately with carbon fiber, it's great for you to be able to see how well it heals, but also doesn't hide your mistakes. And so really the radial um, lucency of carbon fiber plates allows you to be able to see across and be able to see exactly how well your work is doing and also how well the patient is progressing. CT and MRI also is a problem when you're using it with metal. There's a lot of artifacts that come about from it, and because of that, it's a hard, it be, makes it very hard for you to be able to, qual to assess with quality how well your healing is occurring, if there's also any other lesions that are occurring, particularly in cancer patients. 
Some people have a potential allergic response with metal, uh, and uh, there's also some barometric problems with metal. Sometimes the abrupt changes in coldness and also in pressures of the environment can cause pain, as a lot of our patients have experienced with standard metal implants. And with titanium particularly, there's also cold welding, particularly with certain types of screws that go beyond the torque limits. So carbon fiber has actually been around longer than most of us have heard, okay? And there's been a lot of literature that, have, that has uh, investigated carbon fiber, not truly in a clinical setting, but more so in a basic science setting. But there are studies that have really looked at uh, carbon fiber peak biocompatibility, and because of this, the FDA has also looked into this as well. And really, the clinical experience and safety of the carbon fiber profile has expanded to about approximately 10 years. And so if you look on PubMed, you can actually see that there's a lot of studies that have been out there that have investigated into carbon fiber and the safety of which. CarboFix has really uh, been a pioneer forefront in terms of becoming FDA approved for the use of this technology. So why do we use carbon fiber? Okay, so we've talked a lot about this modulus issue. So if you look at the modulus elasticity of stainless steel, it's tremendously high compared to what you have for cortical bone. Okay, and so there is an implication regarding this in terms of being able to match the amount of strain that's required along the fracture site for you to heal, particularly when it comes to relative stability constructs where you need callus formation. Okay. There's a possibility that if you have too high of a modulus, that ends up happening is that you are now inhibiting the necessary micromotion that's necessary for callus to heal and abundantly form along a fracture site. Titanium was a solution to that, but titanium is still higher than carbon fiber. If you look, carbon fiber composites have 75 relative to quarter bones 25, whereas titanium is still about 100. And so it's still roughly a four times increase in terms of the modulus elasticity of cortical bone. And so with carbon fiber being closer to modulus elasticity, we would expect to see more callus formation. And when I show you in the clinical slides, you will see that there's actually more callus formation at the early stages of healing. And we kind of dubbed that term bone phyllic. The, for some reason, the bone seems to like the carbon fiber environment that it generates and tends to heal callus formation very robustly. Not only that though, but carbon fiber also has excellent fatigue properties. So as John said before, they did a lot of four point bending tests and you can see that it actually generates a very favorable profile in terms of fatigue. You could stand one million cycles without failure or damage. Not only that though, but you can also show, see that the uh, strength and the strain of it is also much more favorable than a metal. This was a study that was sponsored by CarboFix, and you see they compared their carbon fiber implants to a Depew Polyax plate. And you see here that both of them, within 60% of their static load, had a better um, load to failure and a maximum load to failure as compared to metal, okay? Where the plate broke, but in carbon fiber, it did not. And so this was pretty, uh, this was pretty amazing. Okay, so as what John said before, the initial romance with this plate was really with tumor physicians. They liked the fact that they can see through the plate. They liked the fact that they can evaluate it without metal artifact. They liked the fact that they can induce, they can apply radiation therapy if needed with, with minimal scatter. But the other thing also is that with the slower healing rates that you see with oncologic patients, carbon fiber was the answer for them because it tended to last longer than the traditional metal implants, which can fail sooner. And so for them, there was a huge gravitation towards utilizing carbon fiber <laughs> as opposed to metal implants. Okay. Now, how did they make it? Okay. Now, most of this is proprietary, but the way that carbon fiber strength is imparted with carbon fixed implants is that they like to use cross-sectional uh, layering of the fibers. So what they do is they layer the, direction, uh, the fiber, fibers into one direction, and then they longitudinally wrap the fibers in another direction, and it's what gives it its tensile strength. And so they, they were able to do this. Now, a lot of the machining for this and a lot of the molding for this is pretty expensive, but Carbon, CarboFix has the ability for them to mold and develop this technology in a pretty cost-efficient manner. How? I don't know. You have to ask them. Okay. So the potential effects of healing, we talked about this bone phyllic model. Well, I'm gonna show you some clinical examples of where this bone phyllic model really comes to pass. So if you look at this immediate post-op film versus two weeks and four weeks, at two weeks, you're already starting to see callus formation. Now, if you look at the normal healing rates of bone, when we're talking about just basic biology, the first two weeks are inflammatory. And it's really at the beginning of two weeks when you start seeing the beginning stages of bone of bone being laid down in terms of callus. And so radiographically, you're not supposed to really see into around four to six weeks with traditional metal implants. But with carbon fiber, the belief is that it induces such a favorable healing environment that yet you're seeing callus formation pretty soon. So at two weeks, you're already seeing callus formation, indicated by the red arrows. And I apologize, it got shifted. At four weeks, you can actually see that the maturation is even further. You can argue that for traditional metal implants, you probably would see the callus formation that you would see here at the two week more so around the four to six week 
And for the four weekend plant that you see here, you probably see it more around the eight to 12 week. And so you're really placing the, the load of the healing a lot sooner, which is favorable, particularly for plate implants, which we'll go into a little bit. Because the implications regarding that is that when you're dealing with a load bearing implant, such as a plate, this may allow you to weight bear a lot sooner. And so that can really help with rehabilitation and also with patients who need to walk sooner. For example, a periprosthetic femur fracture. So this is a case example of a 34-year-old male, has an isolated left femoral humeral shaft fracture. Most of us would uh, offer either plating or plating this, but nailing also has an indication here as well, particularly if you want to weight bear sooner. And with this, this is a standard nail that was done, okay? And you can see here that carbon fiber, it's, it's kind of spooky. You can't really see the implant there. And so because of that, what they do is they actually place these little metal wires in there to guide and show you where everything is supposed to belong. The interlocks obviously are, are metal implants. You can see here at three weeks, you're already starting to see a pretty significant degree of callus formation, which is really not typically seen in metal implants. This is a 23-year-old male with bilateral femur fractures. Here's a left and a right. And you can see here that both of them were, in, were uh, stabilized with retrograde intramedullary nails. And at two weeks, you can already see the beginning of callus formation. And at 12 weeks, you can see that callus formation is robust. This is pretty impressive for 12 weeks. Typically, we see this more around 18 to 24 weeks. And so this is very, very impressive. This is one where we did actually a right side retrograde intramedullary nail that's carbon fiber and the left side that was done actually with a standard titanium nail. Now, the one thing to note is that the right side actually was open and stripped. So while the fracture pattern may look more simple, the biological insult to the fracture on the right was more severe than the one on the left, okay? And you can also argue that the one on the left, you expect to probably heal a little bit better because it's a common fracture with lower strain. So if you believe in stress strain theories, the left side probably should heal faster. Well. We fixed it with metal on the left, and we fixed it with carbon fiber on the right, okay? And you can see here, at four weeks, the callus formation that was evident along the right was much more dramatic than one on the left, okay? Now, you can argue that probably there was just as a higher degree of soft tissue stripping on along the left, but I would also argue to you that the left side, would you would experience a great degree of callus formation because of the fact that there was high comminution and low strain. Now, this guy, unfortunately, did represent at about a year mark. He tried to kill himself again, okay? The first one was from a uh, suicidal uh, attempt, and the second time was, again, through another suicidal attempt. And here, he developed uh, multiple pelvic ring fractures, which were treated non-op, but he also developed a right intertrochanteric hip fracture. And you can see here, we were able to place a DHS device along the right side, and a couple of take-home notes from this. Number one is that you can see that we were able to introduce a DHS device without much interference with the carbon fiber device. So. In terms of a periprosthetic nature of this implant, it functions very similar to that of a metal implant. So there's no added drawbacks to the use of this implant. The second thing you'll notice is that the callus formation and the eventual consolidation of the bone is pretty equivalent for both sides of the fracture. Okay, so you could probably argue and say, well, you know, what's the difference then? Why should I use carbon fiber over metal if they're gonna be the same in one year? Well, for a nail where it's a load sharing device, it probably is gonna be the same at long term. But a short term, if you have more callus formation robustly at the early stages of healing and you can initiate weight bearing a lot sooner, there's where your re reported benefit's gonna be. Couple with the fact that you're dealing with a fracture which has a relative 97% healing rate. And so for you to be able to say, well, one side's supposed to heal better than the other, it's kind of hard to be able to tease that out. But with that being said though, the fact that you can see that there's reproducible healing shows that carbon fiber is gonna perform just as well, if not better than metal under these circumstances. So here's one example where I think it's gonna really take home the message of where the benefits carbon fiber can come about. This is a 67-year-old female patient who is a florid diabetic, okay? She came with the sugar about 230. She's a smoker, and she also has peripheral vascular disease. So you could talk about her having very, very pro poor protoplasm and poor healing potential, on top of the fact that she's morbidly obese. She has a periprosthetic extraarticular total knee arthroplasty fracture. And so she underwent a uh, carbofix carbon fiber plate post-op. You can argue that the alignment is fairly satisfactory. And at approximately six weeks, you already see that she has very good callus formation along the medial side of the fracture. And at six months, she already had excellent callus formation. Now, going back to the six weeks, most of us, if we did a periprosthetic fracture in this patient, we probably would restrict the weight bearing because we're concerned about her healing potential. Because of the fact that she was already demonstrating excellent callus formation in six weeks, I let her start weight bearing immediately because I felt strong enough in the construct based upon the literature and based upon what I was seeing with her clinically. In the six months, she's actually walking very, very well. And so there's an argument to be had with utilizing this implant to help expedite the healing potential early on to initiate earlier weight bearing. 
So you can see the radi radiographic healing very, very easily with carbon fiber. This is a distal radius fracture that's treated with a standard metal implant as opposed to one that was treated with the distal radius fracture plate from CarboFix. You can see here that you can easily see the fracture site very clearly. You can evaluate for any sources of non-union or delayed union areas. And this allows you to be able to make a judgment quicker. And it also allows you to possibly expedite the rehabilitation status a lot quicker than that. This is one where there was done with a uh, hind foot fusion nail. On the left was carbon fiber, on the right was a standard stainless steel implant. You can see here that with regards to the healing, you can see the tibial tailor and the subtalar fusion a lot clearer than you can with an obstructive metal implant such as this. This is one case in which I did. This was a patient who had tibial tailor fusion after a failed attempt at non-opera management for a bimalar ankle fracture. And we performed this. This was at eight weeks, at eight weeks. And so you can see here that she had excellent uh, beginning signs of consolidation of bone. And normally with the metal implant, I probably couldn't see the tibial tailor joint very, very clearly. But that coupled with the fact that I was seeing good, excellent healing progression, her weight bearing was advanced a lot sooner and she's walking normal now at a year out. Now we talked about how the beginning stages of utilizing carbon fiber were really beneficial for patients who were uh, suffering from cancer and uh, the cancer physicians loved this. Well, the reason why is because you can evaluate the lesions very, very clearly, but we also talked about the importance of the strength and fatigue properties of the implant when it's used in an oncologic patient. On top of that, we also talked about how the healing uh, was also enhanced by the use of radiation therapy. So because of the fact that you're not dealing with the metal implant, the amount of scatter is very, very low. So radiation scatters, okay? Whenever you touch any type of inanimate object, radiation will scatter. Well, with carbon fiber, the radiation passes through fairly easily. And so when you talk to a uh, radiation therapist, they can cone down the radiation treatment and the beam and the dosage to a finer degree and to a less, to a less lethal dosage degree. And because of that, there's less uh, risk of thermal burns, radiation burns, and also side effects of radiation treatment, which could potentially even uh, necrose the bone. And so there is a strong advantage to utilizing uh, carbon fiber in this, in this manner. Not only that though, but there's also no scatter that you can see on, on radiographs. So you can see here there was a patient that had a uh, humeral nail that was placed in. They want to evaluate the pathologic lesion that was around uh, the fracture site uh, that generated this fracture in the first place. And you can see here that based upon the MRI finding, there is absolutely no scatter whatsoever. And you can evaluate the pathologic tissue very, very clearly. Whereas if you use a metal implant, there's absolutely no information you can glean from utilizing uh, an MRI, which then makes the, the, the uh, diagnostic usage um, viability of MRI pretty useless in this regard. Another benefit is the detection of iatrogenic fracture. So this is my fracture, so um, it is what it is. But this is a patient who had a mid-shaft femur fracture and she had a total knee replacement. And so I originally decided to place a retrograde nail instead of an anti-grade nail. Why, I don't know, but be that as it may, the problem, and if you guys have never done a total knee replacement retrograde nail before, is that if a knee is placed a little bit more posteriorly, as in this case, you can see that there's anterior notching here in the front. If it's placed more posteriorly, your starting point is going to be a little more posterior. And so when you do that, you can generate a recurvatum in a fracture, as you see here, okay? Because the, trajectory, the starting trajectory of the nail is going to be a little off-center, okay? Well, the problem, though, is that when you're placing a nail more posterior, you can introduce iatrogenic hoop stresses within a fracture, okay? So if you look right here, the picture on the left, you can see here that this is prior to nailing. You see that it's an intact femur. The fracture is above that. And once the nail is introduced, you can actually see the atrogenic fracture line. Now, this has nothing to do with carbon fiber. This is due with the fact that you're, you, we're using a retrograde device on a total knee replacement. So you have to understand that if you did this with, the, with a metal nail, the same thing would happen. Okay? The difference, however, though, is that if you place the metal nail in there, you will never see this. Okay? And this is actually not an uncommon finding. And so because of this, I was concerned about how much extension there was within the, me the metadiaphyseal region into the articular surface. I attained a, a CT postoperatively. And the one thing you'll notice is this. Number one is I could s clearly see the fracture and I could see where it propagated because of the hoop stresses. But number two, you can also see that there's absolutely zero scatter on the picture on the left. Whereas when you get down to the metal implant, there's a tremendous amount of scatter and there's absolutely no information you can glean from this. And so this allows you to not only see if there's any iatrogenic fractures that you may potentially generate as a result of your surgery, but also allows you to dictate the weight bearing status for her because the fracture existed still within the metadiaphysis, I still allowed the weight bearing, she healed fine. So the most challenging part of utilizing carbon fiber, particularly when it comes to nailing, is the screw holes and interlocking screw holes distally and proximally. Okay, this is the part where if you're not too familiar with utilizing perfect circles technique, this could be much, uh, much more significant challenge for you. But what I'll tell you though, is that after you get through the first couple, 
you become much more facile with it and it becomes just as easy as utilizing perfect circles technique. And so there's various markers that they place within the nail to allow you to see where the nail outlines really are. Obviously, if you put an invisible nail in there, you kind of want to see where it begins and ends. So with the proximal nail, you'll see that they put a little metal piton on the top of the nail, which shows you where the top of the nail is. You can see here on this proximal nail on the left, the humerus, it's probably a little bit proud, okay? Whereas uh, along the distal aspect, you'll see that there is this line that runs all the way down to the, to the, se through the center. And that shows you not only where the nail, uh, the, the line of the nail is, but also shows you where the nail ends. There's also these little tiny markers next to where the screws are. And these are actually what they use to d determine the perfect circles for the screws, for the nail. So what they do is they embed these little metal pitons around the screw, around screw holes. And then what you have to do is you have to line them up on along both the far side and the near side in order for you to get a perfect circles technique. So the way it looks is like this. You have two metal markers, one along the near side and one along the far side. And what you want to do is you want to be able to triangulate it so it becomes collinear to each other. And what ends up happening is that you can then see the uh, screw hole where you need to plug it in. Now, granted, you have to mentally visualize where the screw hole is supposed to be for you to put the, the, screw, uh, the screw in. But once you get those two line, lined up, it actually is facilitated fairly easily. So the way it works is after you line it up, you then put your drill bit right along the center of the hole, and you can actually even see what the outline is of the screw hole there. And sometimes you can even see that if you <coughs> manipulate the KVP and the MA along the fluoro, but you can actually line it up pretty well and you can actually put the a drill bit in there and actually fires in fairly easily. So all you need to do is after you get the proper fluoroscopic markings, you then put your drill bit there dead center, you fire away, and it's pretty much like printing a standard perfect circles technique. Now again, the problem that most people have is that they're used to seeing where the round circle is, and so it's a lot easier to target a round circle than it is to target an imaginary circle. But once you get the, line, the, the lines of the pitons lined up, and if you put the drill bit dead center, you won't miss. The, the screw holes are pretty accommodating to allow that to happen. Okay? But again, Carbofix is going to show you their products. Uh, there's a whole slew of implants that they have out there, both standard DAF seal uh, and one third tubular plates, but they also have a lot of different pre-contour plates as well as their nails. From my experience, their nails work very, very well because of the module elasticity. The pre-contour plates, particularly along uh, meta DAF seal regions where you need excellent callus formation, work very well. I've used your DAF seal narrow plates and broad plates and they work well, just uh, as long as we stay within the confines of the anatomy and what it dictates. Now, lastly, we're going to go over one case. This is their new uh, proximal femoral nail, or their hip nail. This is an 89-year-old female. She had a left base cervical femoral neck fracture. And this is my first time using it, okay? And so I was a little nervous as to how it was going to go because I'm used to using different implants uh, that are metal from different companies, which I won't name right now. But you can see here that I, after I got the reduction, I started my, my starting guide wire in the usual spot that I usually do. And then once you put the nail in, they have this nice uh, marker to determine where the lag screw is going to go, which helps you visualize. And then once you put the lag screw in, you can see here the lag screw actually has a very nice outline, and so you see how deep it's supposed to go. And the compressive device on this works very well. You can see here that it actually compresses the fracture pretty well. And then the set screw sits down very, very nicely. And so once you do that, you can see here that it was actually a fairly simple case to do. And what we normally do it's translatable very easily to these carbon fiber implants. They very nicely mirrored a lot of the techniques and a lot of the uh, instruments that we're used to on a daily basis, and they were able to marry it with a very novel technology. So in summary, um, it's radiolucent. It allows you to see problems, allows you to see healing, allows you to have healing a lot quicker, which can then uh, enhance your weight bearing sooner. There's minimal artifacts on CT and MR, particularly if you're using those modalities to help um, evaluate the fracture site or pathologic lesions. Um, there's excellent advantage because of that in radiation therapy to minimize scatter. There's excellent fatigue strength as we've shown biomechanically and also clinically in terms of its uh, robustness in terms of uh, callus formation. Uh, surgical techniques, surgical sizes, uh, implant variability, they're all similar across the board amongst other manufacturers and so you're no, you don't have to necessarily relearn a new technique in order to use this. This is really translatable and obviously this is all FDA and CE approved and so it's very to use. So uh, at this point I take any questions and I also like to introduce Carbofix to come up as well. Yes, Dr. Rehan. Uh, well, you mentioned cost several times. Do you really think it's actually So the cost actually is pretty comparable. Okay, so, you know, I'm, I'm not at the negotiating table at the hospitals when it comes to this, but what I was, but when Bruce and I go and use these implants, we don't ever get any pushback from the hospital in terms of using these costs because uh, Carbofix and distributors that we have typically are very good at trying to match the implant costs that we have 
for what we use. And in fact, at times, it could actually be a little bit cheaper because the amount of stuff that they use is pretty much no frills. It's very basic and it's very slimmed down to only what you need. And so the amount of trays that they need are much less than your standard, um, uh, let's say, gamma nail or TFN set, which comes in multiple trays. They, they are, they're slimmed down a lot more. And so their implant processing and uh, overall costs are about comparable to what you're seeing right now. So it's not like, for example, you're paying three or four times out from what you're normally paying. I think they're, they're comparable. I don't think they're more expensive. I think they're comparable. When, when I was told, they were comparable. Their, their current plate line doesn't have anything for distal humerus, and so whenever I have a distal humerus plate, I would then have to revert to a traditional titanium or stainless steel implant. Uh, but they have uh, pre contour plates for fibula, for distal fibula, no, for distal fibula, for distal radius, for proximal humerus, distal femur. Well, the wear debris is, um, the, the, I guess the original first generation of wear debris, they were concerned about going to lymph nodes and causing a reaction. Right now, they've done multiple studies and shown that the wear debris of there is minimal and doesn't really cause a, a significant robust inflammatory reaction to it. There's FDA studies that have actually proven that. And so I think the first generation prior to them coming out with this was concerned. At this point right now, it's no longer concerned as much. I had one patient that I had to take back. Uh, it was for a patient who had a wound dehiscence uh, and I, I indeed it, and she was at uh, 12 weeks out, and there was no reaction I saw then. I have not had to take one out yet, uh, but you know I've only been using this for about a year and a half. But uh, at to date, though, I've not seen any uh, deleterious effects, and a majority of my patients have healed. That I believe. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is I think that um, if the machining of the car of the carbon fiber screws are very very tough, and I think that the uh, I, I think that's the only reason, but the, you guys can answer that. It's why they're, they're metal rather than carbon fiber. I was told that the reason why is because the machining of the screws were, were very challenging for carbon fiber. Actually, no, I had, I had one experience with it. Not directly, though. So I had one patient who um, had a, uh, a C3 type mid shaft femur fracture that I fixed, and she went to go follow up in, in Illinois, and then uh, her nail dynamized, self dynamized, and her, her titanium screws failed. And so she went up to an orthopedic surgeon in Illinois where her hometown was, and they'd never heard of this implant before. So uh, they called me, and immediately I called Carbofix, and Carbofix said, no problem, we'll send someone up there. And they actually shipped, I think, they, I think Kevin, they got in touch with you, and then he got it set up there, and they would get the nail out, no problem. And so um, although the numbers of people who use them are less, and uh, the, the mating is a little bit different than typical nails, uh, it's not hard to get out. And I talked to the surgeon as a follow-up afterwards. He said that getting out of the nail was no problem. It was pretty much getting out of any other nail. Yeah. I know that sometimes like with a respirator, you can actually scope it in. But with nails, it's So, um, I think for the year and a half, uh, the, almost, actually, you know I'll say this. All the femoral nails that we've done have been retrograde. Um, because the, the nail is, a, in essence, a piriformis nail. So you can either go piriformis or retrograde and, you know, um, my partner and I, we, we have an affinity for going retrograde. It's just a lot easier. And um, I think we've done close to almost about 40, 50. I, I, we lost count of how many we did in the past year. And um, we haven't had any issues of synovitis. Um, and so it's so far been promising. Now, granted, I think that we would need long-term studies to fully validate and vet that out. But at the same time, though, we've not seen any issues of synovitis up to a year at this point from, from anecdotal evidence based upon what we've seen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think that the FDA, because they were so, they, they were, uh, so um, attuned to the initial first generation issues um, in terms of the, of the reactivity to it, they really took a hard, long, hard look at all of this, and you know, they were able to pass without any problems. So that's, that's, uh, it just shows you about how much further they've come along in terms of their manufacturing process and, and development. Exactly. So in essence, what you can do is you can, in essence, turn that plate, the neutralization plate, into an ex internal external fixator, right, and use locking screws. Because when you put the locking screws in there, you're not forcing uh, st stability based upon bone plate opposition and friction. You're, you're basing it based upon a fixed angle implant. And so the way that you get around it is if you were truly 
gung-ho about using this plate and not wanting to wait for the plate to bend down to the bone, you can put a buttress plate on there still, put locking screws in there. Granted, that's really her heretic to an AO person, but it works because the thing is that you're still getting a strength of the plate against the bone in certain spots, and it's going to work, right, if you're using locking screws. And so, yeah, there are ways around it. And, you know, granted, if you are near a subcutaneous surface, the plate may be prominent, but if you're in the humerus or if you're in a proximal tibia along the posterior medial aspect, you're not going to feel it. It's so close to the bone, it's not going to be, you're not going to feel it at all. My opinion on that is that, you know, if it were metal, it would be really stiff. Yeah. And the reason why I went for all lock construct there, and John astutely pointed it out, was simply because, you know, we, we've, in our use of distal femoral plates, we found that the contour always dictates where the fracture goes. And so if we put a non-locking screw in there, it tends to put it into a golf club varus deformity that we typically see. And so a lot of times my response has been, okay, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna just line up the fracture where I need to line up. I'm gonna put the plate in there. If I could put a non-locking screw in there and get the, get the plate to sit where it needs to sit and the bone to sit where it needs to sit, I will be okay. Nine times out of 10 though, it doesn't do that. And so I'll put a locking screw in there to kind of lock up the reduction, okay? But the problem that you get with, with metal implants is that it makes it too stiff. And so if you look at the literature from a lot of the groups that do this and study it, they show that they develop a non-union because of that reason. There's just too much stiffness in the environment. You can't handle it. This may be the solution. This may be the balance between, okay, you know what? We can hold the reduction. We can still put in a lock-in implant, particularly in osteoporotic bone, such as this patient. Poor biology, still get good robust callus formation at six weeks. Right? We, if I had done this in, with a metal implant at six weeks, I probably would not have seen as great callus formation at six weeks at, as I had with this. So what I did, um, I cheated a little bit. <laughs> I cheated. So, um, uh, so the, the, the size nail on uh, the femur on that right was a, I think it was a nine or 10. And so I had enough space around it and I floated the screws in front of behind the nail. So I made a transcortical screw. Whereas the, the nail on the left, I think that was a, uh, that was a one millimeter larger. Um, yeah, yeah. I've done a head-to-head. -head. Well, in our end of one, um, it seems pretty, pretty promising. It's just it's very hard to be able to do it in the same patient. You, you know, if you're talking about just being able to compare two different patient groups, we're trying to get the numbers. Um, but right now, based upon our preliminary data, anecdotally, right, and uh, mind you, it's, it's still very early. Um, we've so far seen that the ca what we were trying to investigate is a couple things. One is callus volume. Uh, number two is going to be rate of callus formation in terms of time. So the callus volume is very hard to determine, and the reason why is because you, in order for you to truly quantitate callus volume, you need to get a CT scan. And unfortunately, if you put a metal, ar metal nail in there, there's going to be a lot of artifacts, so they may, they may potentially underestimate the amount of callus that you have. So that's one limitation to that study. Um, however, with that being said, though, based upon just basic radiographic analysis, it looks at the callus volume for a standard uh, carbon fiber nail is going to be a lot more voluminous than that of a metal nail. Number two is that you can look at the rapidity in which the callus comes and it looks like based upon our initial data that the carbon fiber gives you much more callus at an earlier rate. So if you look at you know, just the four or five uh, clinical exams that we've shown, you can see that the callus formation is a lot more robust. It's much more um, exuberant. And so those are all very promising. Now, again, like I said, clinically, it doesn't matter. Well, in a nail, may or may not, because you're dealing with the load-sharing implant. But I think where this, the data could get translated very easily is when you look at a plate construct. When you look at a plate construct, we are always waiting for callus formation before we initiate weight-bearing. That's really the, the go-to as to when we say, okay, fine, you have a relative stability construct that we plated. The moment you weight bear is when we start seeing actual, you know, you know, significant callus formation and the alignment's maintained. Well, if we're seeing callus formation much sooner with a carbon fiber, then you can, you, know, you can speculate that that means that we can let them weight bear a lot sooner, which means that the rehab is going to be a lot quicker, there's going to be less mus muscle and skin atrophy, much more range of motion. It's, it's overall very promising to be able to think that happening. Have you changed the weight bearing status in some of these? Yeah, so the distal femurs, like that, that, those distal femurs, that's just one of them. Um, I've done, I think, uh, four or five periprosthetic total, total knees. And all of them I've allowed to weight bear about six weeks sooner than I usually do. Usually I let them weight bear not until 12 weeks. Now I let them weight bear at six instead. Just because I'm, I'm feeling a lot more confident and so far I'm not seeing any failures with those. Is that because of the strength of the implant or because of the cow? 
both. Both. Because the thing is, I'm feeling good with both, right? I'm feeling, okay, there's callus, that's good. That's a good sign that there's good biology going on. And it's relative stability, so they're going to be able to auto-protect themselves to a certain degree, but at the same time, I'm also confident in the implant that I have. I know that the amount of cyclic loads that they're going to induce upon that implant, it's probably going to outlast out of a metal implant. So for me, I'm saying, okay, fine, the combination of both are allowing me to weight bear a lot sooner. Awesome. Thanks, Will. No, thank you. Thank you.